Excerpts from the Spirit of the Liturgy, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. In the Mediterranean world in which Christianity came into being, the first day of the week was regarded as the day of the sun, while the other days were allotted to the various planets then known. The Christian's day of worship was determined by the remembrance of God's action, the date of the resurrection of Jesus. But now this date came to carry the same cosmic symbolism that also determined the Christian direction of prayer. The sun proclaims Christ. Cosmos and history together speak of him. And to this a third factor was added. The first day is the beginning of creation. The new creation takes up the old creation. The Christian Sunday is also a festival of creation, thanksgiving for the gift of creation, for the let there be with which God established the being of the world. It is thanksgiving for the fact that God does not let creation be destroyed, but restores it after all of man's attempts to destroy it. The first day contains St. Paul's idea of the whole creation waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Romans 8.19 Just as sin wrecks creation, as we can see, so it is restored when the sons of God make their appearance. Sunday thus explains the commission given to man in the account of creation. Subdue the earth, Genesis 1.28. This does not mean enslave it, exploit it, do with it what you will. No, what it does mean is recognize it as God's gift. Guard it and look after it as sons look after what they have inherited from their father. Look after it so that it becomes a true garden for God and its meaning is fulfilled so that for it too God is all in all. This is the orientation that the fathers wanted to express by calling the day of the resurrection the eighth day. Sunday looks not only backward, but forward. Looking toward the resurrection means looking toward the final consummation. With the day of the resurrection coming after the Sabbath, Christ, as it were, strode across time and lifted it up above itself. The fathers connected with this the idea that the history of the world as a whole can be seen as one great week of seven days, corresponding to the ages of a man's life. The eighth day, therefore, signifies the new time that has dawned with the resurrection. It is now, so to speak, concurrent with history. In the liturgy, we already reach out to lay hold of it, but at the same time, it is ahead of us. It is the sign of God's definitive world in which shadow and image are superseded in the final mutual indwelling of God and his creatures. Sunday is, for the Christian, time's proper measure, the temporal measure of his life. It is not an arbitrary convention that could be exchanged for another, but contains a unique synthesis of the remembrance of history, the recalling of creation, and the theology of hope. For Christians, 
It is the weekly returning feast of the resurrection, though it is one that does not render a specific remembrance of Christ's Passover superfluous. It is quite clear from reading the New Testament that Jesus approached his hour with full awareness. The phrase emphasized in St. John's Gospel, the hour of Jesus, certainly has many layers of meaning, but first and foremost, it refers to a date. Jesus did not want to die on just any date. His death had a significance for history, for mankind, for the world. That is why it had to be woven into a very particular cosmic and historical hour. It coincides with the Passover of the Jews as set out and regulated in Exodus chapter 12. St. John and the Epistle to the Hebrews show in a special way how it incorporates the content of other feasts, especially the Day of Atonement, but its proper date is Passover. The Lord's death is not any kind of accident. It is a feast. It brings an end to what is symbolically opened up in the Passover. He takes it, as we have seen, from replacement to reality, to the vicarious ministry of his self-oblation. The Passover is the hour of Jesus. It is precisely in connection with this date that we see the universal significance of Jesus' death for human history. At first, Passover was the feast of nomads. From Abel to the Apocalypse, the sacrificed lamb is a type of the Redeemer, of his pure self-giving. We do not need to go farther into the importance of nomadic culture in the origins of biblical religion. What is significant is this that monotheism was not able to develop in the great cities and fertile countryside of Mesopotamia. No, it was in the wilderness, where heaven and earth face each other in stark solitude, that monotheism was able to grow. In the homelessness of the wanderer, who does not deify places, but has constantly to put his trust in the God who wanders with him. It has recently been pointed out that the date of Passover coincides with the constellation of Aries the Ram, the Lamb. This was of no more than marginal importance for the fixing of the date of Easter. What was essential was the connection with the date of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which was of its very nature linked with the Jewish liturgical calendar. Now this link, raising as it does the question of the relation of New Testament to Old and of the newness of Christianity, was to have explosive potential. In the second century AD, it led to the Easter controversy, which was not to be settled, at least for the great church, until the Council of Nicaea, 325. On the one hand, there was the custom in Asia Minor of conforming to the Jewish calendar and always celebrating the Christian Easter on 14 Nisan, the date of the Jewish Passover. On the other hand, there was the custom, especially in Rome, of regarding Sunday, the day of the resurrection, as the determining factor. The Christian Easter should, therefore, be celebrated on the Sunday after the first full moon of spring. The Council of Nicaea promulgated this decision. 
Through its ruling, the solar and lunar calendars were interconnected, and the two great cosmic forms of ordering time were linked to each other in association with the history of Israel and the life of Jesus. But let us return to the image of the Lamb, or Ram. In the fifth century, there was a controversy between Rome and Alexandria about what the latest possible date for Easter could be. According to Alexandrian tradition, it was April 25th. Pope Saint Leo the Great, 440 to 461, criticized this very late date by pointing out that, according to the Bible, Easter should fall in the first month. And the first month did not mean April, but the time when the sun is passing through the first part of the zodiac, the sign of Aries. The constellation in the heavens seemed to speak, in advance and for all time, of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, John 129, the one who sums up in himself all the sacrifices of the innocent and gives them their meaning. The mysterious story of the ram caught in the thicket and taking the place of Isaac as the sacrifice decreed by God himself was now seen as the prehistory of Christ. The fork of the tree in which the ram was hanging was seen as a replica of the sign of Aries, which in turn was the celestial foreshadowing of the crucified Christ. We should also say that Jewish tradition gave the date of March 25th to Abraham's sacrifice. Now, as we shall see presently, this day was also regarded as the day of creation, the day when God's word decreed, let there be light. It was also considered very early on as the day of Christ's death and eventually as the day of his conception. We may see a reflection of these connections in the first epistle of St. Peter, which describes Christ as the lamb without blemish, demanded by Exodus 12:5, and destined before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1:20. The mysterious words in Revelation 13:8 about the lamb slain from the beginning of the world, translated from the German, could also perhaps be interpreted in the same way though other translations are possible that tone down the paradox. These cosmic images enabled Christians to see in an unprecedented way the world embracing meaning of Christ and so to understand the grandeur of the hope inscribed in Christian faith. This is most illuminating it seems clear to me that we have to recapture this cosmic vision if we want once again to understand and live Christianity in its full breadth. Astonishingly, the starting point for dating the birth of Christ was March 25th. As far as I know, the most ancient reference to it is in the writings of the African ecclesial author Tertullian, circa 150 to 207, who evidently assumes as a well-known tradition that Christ suffered death on March 25th. In Gaul, right up to the sixth century, this was kept as the immovable date of Easter. In a work on the calculation of the date of Easter, written in A.D. 243 and also emanating from Africa, we find March 25th interpreted as the day of the world's creation. And in connection with that, 
we find a very peculiar dating for the birth of Christ. According to the account of creation in Genesis 1, the sun was created on the fourth day, that is, on March 28th. This day should, therefore, be regarded as the day of Christ's birth, as the rising of the true sun of history. This day was altered during the third century, so that the day of Christ's passion and the day of his conception were regarded as identical. On March 25th, the Church honored both the Annunciation by the angel and the Lord's conception by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin.